Hi, my name is Lungi and I'm from Goldmine Finance. Today I'm sitting with three youngins, um, very entrepreneurial in their thinking. They've traveled around the world. Um, their lessons are going to equip us today on our entrepreneurial journeys. I am sitting here today with Les Simpele, Mali Kashamaza, and Karanjan Caesar. Um, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I can't wait for you to share your journey and your experiences. Yeah, thank you for thank having, you us. having us. It's a really comfortable couch. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Um, my first question, um, the employment space is changing. So how do you build a brand? How do you start evolving over the space that you are in? I mean, how do you set yourself apart? Molly, you want to start? Ladies first. Today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you said, you've asked two questions. How do you build a brand and how do you set yourself apart? Yeah. Um, I think setting yourself apart would probably be look at what everyone else is doing and then ask yourself what you can do differently so you can have something to sort of distinguish you. So um, I'm just going to say chef because we have a chef here. It's just the easiest thing. I mean, like if you're a chef, like the thing that's coming to mind is that guy who did, does the soul thing like this. <laughs> like, believe it or not, that's like, that's a brand. It's a thing. <laughs> because like everyone does their soul like this. So he's like, all right, I'm going to do it like this. And like, yeah, right. And so just something of that sort. So I think just you set yourself apart by looking at what everyone else is doing and figuring out how you can do something different while still being true to whatever it is that you want to put forward or to communicate or to provide or something of that sort. All right, Karanja? Um, I would say, and especially considering the changing landscape of employment, yeah. um, I would say identifying the skills, because I've come to find, at least on, on, on my journey, that uh, employers are no longer the employers of our parents' generation who are looking for hard skills. You're a typist, you're a typist. <laughs> or you're a engineer, civil engineer, and that's all we need. Or, right. And so you find it's good to know your, your hard skills, but also your, your more transferable soft skills, you know? So organizations are lately are not scaling too quickly, too fast. You know, we have all these startups that are trying to find their ways and smaller, mid, sm small to mid-scale organizations, and they want somebody who can dip their toe in different ponds in the organization or in the company. Mm -hmm. um, and so those transferable skills of so management or um, leadership or problem solving. So they know that you have that job title, but you can run operations or you can dip in here when they need you to because um, people, the, the way people are employing now is a little more different. It's who, who is more versatile, who is more uh willing to to kind of take up the mantle here and take ownership of processes that we didn't even know needed ownership you know because that's that's really the direction where people are going and people are not even doing permanent stuff anymore people will have a consultant people will have so it's that fluidity and just identifying what transferable skills you have that can allow you to kind of shuffle between spaces and between uh, arenas or fields okay Liz? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, some, some really good points have been shared. And I'll just say that using uh, Mali's example, that how you build a brand, first and foremost, is knowing that everyone is unique. Yeah. So you just need to find what makes you unique, what makes you stand out from the pack. Don't copy anyone. If you're, let's say, a chef, for example, um, Salt Bay might do that, then doesn't mean that because it's worked with him, then you need to jump on that bandwagon. Right, thing, so yeah. everyone has their own thing. You just need to be patient enough to really internalize and find out what that is for you. Now, Karanja mentioned fluidity. I would say be consistent because we live in such a dynamic world where there's information at every turn. There's inspiration everywhere. Uh, I'll, I'll read a book um, authored by Mali and I'll be inspired and I'll use the principles that she's used or she's um, um, been, uh, she's been, you know, principles that have governed her mm -hmm. 
to and apply it in my practice. I'll, for example, see how well um, Karanja expresses himself when he's trying to, to sell a room, for example, or a couple of rooms. And I'll be like, okay, I would want to apply the same principles in my cooking and in selling my onions. So it's really the same thing where we, first, first and foremost, you build a brand by identifying what makes you stand out and then be consistent with that trade, with that craft. So one thing I would say about um, our generation is that in as much as you might find that unique factor, we give up too easily. We, we, we run off at the first sign of failure and that's also a part of the process. So you be patient, you be consistent, and you stay true and grounded to what your, your, your it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've bumped into each other and we sort of like realized that we have the same um, kind of thinking. Kind of like enjoyed each other's company, which has been awesome and a blessing in uh, many ways. So an entrepreneur gets this idea and then they hit you know, a, a hard wall and they don't know how to, to push through. Obviously in your journeys, in the entrepreneurial mindsets that you've had, you have hit those hard walls. Um, I'd like to start off with Les because I love his story of, of how he overcame. So Les tells me that in Kenya, he tried to sell traditional food at a premium price. And everybody just thought that this guy's mad. What's he talking about? I mean, my mama can make that. How did you, how did you navigate through that journey? Um, again, knowing that that's a unique uh, offer. Yes. In the sense that you, uh, so I, I'm born and raised in Nairobi. Yeah. And I have grown mm -hmm. up in a culture. <laughs> Two uh, Kenyans in the building? <laughs> <laughs> Technically three. Sure. Yes. 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 Three Kenyans in the building. She's an exile. <laughs> and, and a fourth one on the way. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I've grown up in a, in, a, in, a, in a country or in a society that celebrates other people's cultures. Mm. So you look at, let me use a very typical example, pizza you'll find pizza is one of the most amazing dishes you come across. But we have been so quick to jump onto other people's bandwagon yeah. and not even do it, we don't do it well. And we are so committed to celebrating other people's cultures. So reverse the roles and look at what or the origin of some of these dishes. And you'll find that they are foods or uh, meals that came out of sustenance a place of need, a place of survival where uh, pizza, pasta, and, and all these de derivatives of these meals come from one ingredient. So you look at a country where I come from and uh, the staple is very, um, it's very basic, but it's out of that basic staple that you consistently build into, you know, something that becomes a cultural uh, dish. So back to what you are asking, um, one of the, the biggest backlashes I, fa I faced in my career was when I wanted to turn something as simple as a Kenyan staple like ugali into, fr into fries, to ugali fries, which at first people, people will always be um, against change. But then if you're consistent, then slowly by slowly you start, people will, will kind of appreciate what you're trying to do. So it was very difficult in the beginning, but um, seeing that uh, we come from a very diverse and food rich uh, background, um, people started kind of appreciating the, 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 the taste of uh, modern Kenyan food. Awesome. Molly and Karanja, your, your journeys? Um, mine has been, I think for me, what I would consider the area of maybe fate I don't know, failure or sort of struggle would be, they call it the curse of the creatives, where you have so many things that you do well or so many things that you're good at. And so for me, that's where I found the struggle because I'm trying to do and 
manage 10 things at the same time, have them all up to the best standard that I can, do it on my own because what's in my head, I don't think anyone else can execute it. I just, yeah. And so I've slowly had to learn over the years that it's okay to focus. Focus on one thing, find that one thing, be consistent with it and focus on it. And eventually I think that it opens doors for you into the other things maybe, or you find other ways to let everything else slip into, fit into this one thing. And then, um, so it's sort of just been that journey of learning that it's okay to focus, it's okay to focus and give the thing time. You can't do 10 things all at the same time, but also learning to partner with people because you find that many times you share your ideas with someone and actually you're able to pull off something with someone else. It's not that everything that lives in my head, I'm the only person in the entire universe that can pull it off, right? Because there'll be someone else who'll be able to maybe refine the idea and make it better because they bring something else to the table. So I, just for me, it's been learning to work with other people, learning, you know, the power of partnerships, right partnerships, just, you know, making use of the people around you and just learning that it's okay to focus. In fact, it's better to find your thing and focus on that. And then eventually, once you get known for that and once you're better in that area, then everything else grows. Karanja. Yeah, she, she, that last part really resonated with me. And th that's what I've learned as in adversity. And also what I've learned of adversity is, uh, especially on an entrepreneurial journey or a creative journey as well, because I do consider myself a creative in, in some ways, um, it's when you try to do everything by yourself and you, you, you hold so closely, and especially on the creative journey, because it's, it's a, creative expression is such a personal journey and that you want to keep everything to yourself and it can get overwhelming. It can get overwhelming. You, you need a soundboard or you need a collaborator or you need um, somebody with the hard skills that you don't possess. Um, that's something that I have learned. Every time I hit a wall, it was because I was, I was trying to do everything on my own. And, and there's, there's, it's very difficult to do. And I'm not, as, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a stupid man. I'm not, su I'm not a genius. <laughs> I'm not a genius, but I'm not, I'm not dumb. You right. know what I mean? It's like, but still, even for somebody of fair, like astute mental ability, right. yeah. uh, you can't do everything. Um, really and so you need to, you know, inject some skills from outside. And, um, and it can be hard as well because you have to find people you trust and people that compliment you and compliment your skills. But once you do that, it opens up so much more it opens up so much possibility it gives you rest it gives you um encouragement it gives you and it calls you out so you don't make mistakes that you might have made so that is something that i found to be very important i don't know if it works for everybody the same way or if it's good for everybody but that's what has been good for me in the past right um guys you've exercised you know bravery in your in your journeys you have you have because most people would never dare to work outside their countries because they don't want to leave comfort. And some of you, well, all of you have traveled outside your countries and you've enjoyed different spaces. And out of that, you, you've managed to get a sort of like, you know, a widening of the mind and opening of the mind and understanding of, of, of different cultures. How, is, how important is that in, an, in any entrepreneur's journey? Bearing in mind that these days you don't have to get on a plane to travel. I mean, how important is to be well-versed and, and well-educated, not just through books, but to going out there and looking at different countries and living in those spaces? Karanja, you start. <laughs> Yeah, I think as the last time she started, she took my... my yeah, <laughs> you take it first. <laughs> um, so my response to that will not be about the actual going out and the getting out and putting yourself out there and the travel and the experience. It'll be the, why don't you do it? Yeah. And I discovered in the, why don't you do it? It's like, why have I never tried to live outside of the country, looked for a job outside of the country or accepted a job out of the country because there's some that I'd actually turned down. And in answering that, why have I not, I discovered that the fear, because you'd be like, oh, you know, I'm an only child of a single mother, which is the truth. But my mom don't miss me. You know, like she's, she's a grown woman. <laughs> she, like, she's, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's, it's not to do with that. She's not an invalid. She's not a, 
you know, she's a working person, she's not a dependent. Then you find another reason, another excuse, and then you find that the fear is in actually facing yourself. And that discovery helped me grow a lot. So it was the, in asking the why not that I, that it really helped me to commune with myself and like look inward and find some things about myself that I was like, okay, actually I can be bold, I can be courageous, I can be that. I don't fear failure as much as I thought I used to. I still do, but I don't as much as I used to. It used to be crippling and now I'm facing it and you know, it's not so bad. Um, so yes, that is why I think it's important to do that is also in the questioning why not. I don't know if that makes sense. It does make sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's the obvious. There's so much you learn from observing how people interact with each other outside of the space in which you use. It teaches you respect. It teaches you restraint. It teaches you. It teaches you also that you, you're not as good as you think you are. Yes. You know, which is important to learn. Um, you're kind of a big deal, but the bigger deals. You know, um, and it helps you. It it, it puts in a place of grateful humi- humility um, and then it, it, it makes you aspire to more. Yeah. So yeah, that, that would be my quickest response to that question. All right. Um, so travel. I think it opens your mind to different experiences. I've had the opportunity of working outside of the country once. I worked in Canada for a f- few weeks my mom lives in canada and i have it was legal (laughs) yeah just to put putting that out there (laughs) um and i think it was just a very different experience from what work is like here in the sense that i learned a lot about work ethic so for example where i worked the entire time that you are on shift there's a locker where you put your phone you don't use it you pick it up maybe during your break, maybe during your lunch time, working in the service industry, which now I understand. I actually get frustrated sometimes, you know, when you walk into a shop and the person isn't serving you because they're on their phone, finishing a conversation with someone on the phone or they're texting. So they're like half serving you. I'm like, I'm here to give you money. Do you want to pay attention? You know, that kind of thing. (laughs) And so it's just, you learn. So for me, one of the things that I learned is, you know, a little something about work ethics and understanding timings and spaces like I'm at work I shouldn't be on my phone you know whatsapping or having conversations of course now the nature of my work is social media so it is my phone but it's learning to discipline myself sometimes I you know slip a little bit but it's learning and understanding to discipline myself and say okay when you're working it's work time use your phone well blah 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 that kind of thing so for me one of the things you know traveling and going outside taught me is just work ethic and all of that but just to be able to see how different things work in different spaces it helps I also usually get a number of bits so I have so many ideas that live in my head (laughs) so I haven't quite overcome the thing yet (laughs) but right but every time I travel I promise you I come back with a new business idea but some of them cost like millions of like dollars so one day (laughs) I don't know figuring out how to put that into action but it just gives you all sorts of different ideas and things yeah Does that make sense? I mean, uh, in my perspective, you really haven't lived if you haven't traveled. You you cannot, I think about how big the world is. And if you've not experienced the other side of it, then you haven't experienced a different perspective. You You haven't experienced a new environment. And with that comes a certain level of your mind being broadened in ways you can't imagine. You see, every time you travel, you come up with a you you come back with a new idea because where you have gotten the opportunity to travel to, there's a a different way of life. There's a different culture. There are different um, there's just a different environment altogether, and so that gives you a certain level of survival that you never have acquired. If you, if you lived in your cocoon, mm-hmm. you will never have experienced the beauty that this world has to offer in everything. Like there's, there's so much magnificence around us from people to landscapes to just 
just the the the, the natural offering of yeah. what the yeah. world has to give. Yeah. Yeah. Food yeah. is what makes what me I travel. <laughs> That's I mean. what makes me travel. Like I literally save up and go to a country just because I, I, I want to experience what that culture has to offer. Okay. Yeah. And everybody eats. So I'm curious to know if in my country we have 50 different cultures and everybody has something different to eat. Think about just one delicious meal from all these different cultures and you get to eat 50 of those. That's close to two months of you eating something different every single day. day. Yeah. Now think about East Africa and then think about Africa and then think about the world. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that comes from that. Um, so for me, you really have not lived if you've not traveled. And you don't even need to travel across the world. You just need to move from your village to the next one. And then that curiosity builds and you're like, okay, let me go to the nearest city. And then another time you go to another city. By the time you know it, you've reached the border. And the dynamics of what you see, the further uh, you are away from home, the more you appreciate life, the more you are grounded by the fact that with everything that is around us, both good and bad, it makes you have a certain appreciation to life. Great. So, big question. Um, we started off with that question when we opened, you know, with the whole uh, employment environment changing, the landscape like totally changing. And I've seen that you guys are equally creative in making sure that you are able to maintain yourselves for the future and, you know, to sustain, you know, whatever you need to do in, in the coming years. I mean, Karanja being a creative uh, Molly being an um, an author, and then the other day bumping into Les's, uh, um, you know, profile, you know, paid partnership with, you know, a you know a beer brand. I'm like, who's this guy, you know? And then I was like inquisitive, was like eleven thousand followers. Like, who is this, you know? So tell me how important it is to actually have multiple income streams. Why, why is that important, and how do you establish that? Karaja, you look like you want to tell me. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't want any of his words taken away from him. Right, so let, let him like start, I'm, I'm not. Like, I'm not oh, risking this. He's like, you talk to me. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It's just like, why is it important? Yeah. Because I, I know it's the reason. I was like, it was because what two years ago I lost my job because we just we just we couldn't operate. We were running a hotel. A group of it was a group of hotels which couldn't stay on its feet any longer and so I was put on indefinite unpaid leave for quite a while and if it wasn't for the extra revenue streams that I had I I, I, I don't know how that that would have gone you know and just so that I mean that's like the obvious why is it important is because uh, you kind of need the money <laughs> you know it's just people don't like to say you should be <laughs> driven by money as, uh, but come on. Uh, the reason is because you do need to get by. You need resources. Even, even, if, even if to relax, you need resources. If to create, to pursue your, to uh, chase your creative pursuits, you still need some sort of resource. And that, unfortunately, in our time is monetary, right? So I think that's, that's one of the major, major chief importances of having multiple revenue streams is just because there might come a time where you need to have a safety net um, and then also it's just uh, in this in these times where there's so many global shifts that are affecting economies um, where one day everything is looking hunky-dory and then the next day there's an an event that changes yeah. the entire economic landscape and you don't know which industry is going to stand which is not you know what I mean um, or what skills are going to be re relevant. Forget now even this industry collapsing, your sk skills might be declared, rendered irrelevant in a few years with technological advancements. So maybe your industry doesn't collapse, but then your career is no longer, it's completely yes. need, no longer needed. Yeah. So they are, they are, I mean, very ob obvious to me, like monetary and financial reasons to have multiple streams of income. 
Um, yeah, as, as to how to do that, uh, for me, I think it's been leveraging social capital. Yeah. That's okay. that for me is, yeah, for other people, I don't, I don't know what your experiences have been like. Les, you next. I, I want, want Molly to be last. Okay. <laughs> Uh, using an ingredient I use every day. <laughs> Eggs. Don't put them all in one basket. That's okay. what they say. Put them all in one basket. You trip, you fall, all your eggs. Alas. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right? So just... If you are fortunate enough to have a job, make sure you have a decent saving because nothing lasts, lasts forever. Yeah. As Karanja says, one day everything is going is hunky-dory. The other, you don't know where to start. So with that in mind, you again need to find what it factor you have, what you can offer. So you may be, let's say, an accountant, but you have a passion in art. You need to capitalize on that because your job is more or less a way of you getting the capital that you need to branch out into whatever whether it's farming or um, arts or starting a business that is going to earn you as little as you may need to just get by. Um, that's, to me, that's important. Getting as many little um, things that you feel relate to you as possible. So yeah, that's, that's just my, my two cents. So as a chef, I would say, teach people how to cook because now social media is available to everybody and I, I also lost my job uh, well I yes kind of lost my job when COVID hit and restaurants had to close uh, no one was going out anymore and my job is directly in related to feeding the masses so because these people are not going out anymore and there are no restaurants out there there are no restaurants there anymore doesn't mean that people won't eat. So it's just finding what you have been doing just in a different way. So I'd still cook, but I'd cook for people virtually. And I would host cooking classes virtually so that now people, I, I thought about it and I was like, now people have time, but not many, all these people who I would feed on a daily basis now don't have any anywhere to go or are trying to save up whatever little indispensable income they had, or rather dispensable income they had, and because they're not going to the restaurants, it doesn't mean that they won't eat, but not many people know how to cook. So why not teach people how to cook good food? Using, you know, I, I put myself in, the shoes, in their shoes because I'm also going through the same thing and I have to cut back on a lot. Now, a lot of people did not have the the, the, again, dispensable income to spend on what they'd ideally eat at restaurants. And so you think about how you will use the very basic um, essentials into creating the same experience as you'd have uh, at a restaurant. So again, leverage, whether it's social capital, in knowing how can I be able to offer a, a certain level of convenience to people with what is at my disposal. Okay. Molly. All right. This awesome as public speaker. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, pressure. <laughs> um, I feel like if there's anything COVID taught us, it's that you definitely need more than one source of income. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important because also sometimes you've sort of both spoken about some of the things that I want to say. Um, sometimes the field that you work in or the career that you work in, some of these things are sort of seasonal, like seasonal in terms of what's going on in the economy. So like, for example, during COVID, the hospitality industry wasn't doing so well. So if all your eggs are in that basket, then the moment something like that happens, you sort of come crumbling down. And so things like that, now that the economy has opened up, it's booming again. So then you find yourself in a space where you're sort of like on a roller coaster like this. Whereas if you're sort of spread out a bit more, then it makes it easier because then now the hospitality industry isn't doing so well, but then maybe in this other area, you know, you have this thing that's working for you. So I think just in terms of understanding the why, that's why I think it's important to have more than one income stream so that 
at any given time, regardless of what things look like, you sort of have some sort of fallback plan. Um, so that's, yeah, you know, that's what I think. In terms of how to do it, um, for me, one of the things that I do is investments. The thing about investments is that they require patience because you're not going to, to get, you know, you might not necessarily see your bank filling up every single week or whatever, but at the end of the year, you know, you have this amount, this amount of interest has been declared, so you know that this is what you've gained back at the end of the day. And if you think in terms of finances, because for me, the reason I'm working towards my finances and trying to grow and be better is because I want to enjoy my retirement. You know, I know someone who used to wake up every single day at 5 a.m. at age 70, 75, to drive halfway across town, to go to work, finish at 5 p.m., come back, just to earn a very meager living. And so this is someone who was close to me, you know, a relative that I have that I got to see and experience. And so when I think about that, I'm like, I definitely don't want to be experiencing that. And so it starts now. And so I'm thinking more in terms of the long term. So investments for me is one of those things because every year, you know, you're getting something back for as long as you're consistently putting in. So investments is one of the hows, I would say. The other thing that I would say, you talked about how you are teaching people. I think teaching is important. If you are um, teaching people, you are adding value. And so the more things you're able to teach. So everything that we do, we have certain skills that we know, you know, soft skills, things that you know, maybe it's something that you've learned and you've kept learning and you've become better over time. Don't keep the information to yourself, teach. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to serve every single person in the world. So the more people there are doing what you can do, the better it is. So I teach public speaking, for example, because I'm not going to speak to every single person and every single audience that there is in the world. So it's better to capitalize on that skill and teach people so that I'm sort of multiplying what it is that I have, that I'm not the only public speaker that there is, that there are people that I can look at and say, okay, this person has learned something because of me. This person has learned something because of me. So in that way, you're adding value to someone, but you're also getting that value back monetarily. So I think that teaching is one of the best things. Every single person has something you can do to teach someone. If you feel like you don't have something to do to teach someone, then I think it's a question of just learning and becoming better. There's something I heard last week. There's a business forum that I watch every Sunday. And so someone said that once you become an expert at something, assume, I'm just paraphrasing, but once you become an expert at something, assume that people will want to learn from you. Because once people know that you are an expert at something, they, you just find people coming to you all the time. Oh, so I have, you know, something happening on Saturday. People have asked me to speak. What do you think I should do? How should I start? Where should I go? Because they look at you as some sort of expert. So why not capitalize on that and find a way to actually start to teach people? Because that's a good way to bring money and it's coming almost from a natural place. Yeah. So I think in terms of the how, that's what I would say. Okay, so we are part of a generation that no longer takes things at face value. Um, we've seen how strong we are in terms of um, being an African generation that thinks, that innovates, that's starting things, right? So are we ready to say that we are going to be able, ugh, okay, I might be tripping myself here, but I'm going to say it. Are we ready to say that we are ready to take on the likes of Gucci as an African generation? Because we, we have our own fashion trends now. We are, we are opening our own doors you know, of trading outside of the African continent. What are some of the things that we can actually innovate in during this time of you know, innovation and thinking outside the box as the African you know, youth or you know, generation new? generation I think I have a lot to say about that <laughs> but I'll try and summarize my thoughts as much as possible yeah using what um, I can relate with yeah food why is it that and again sorry to throw a brand out there why are we so quick as Africans to celebrate let's say KFC yeah. or McDonald's in a way that we will literally queue for hours, yet there's that local guy in the corner who just needs the support. 
he makes as good, if not better, healthier, cheaper food. But because he's local, and this is not a big uh, uh, brand that, 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 that has the backing of an amazing uh, PR campaign, uh, we don't see the use of supporting our own. So I think first and foremost, if a product is good, it's good. There's no difference between a Gucci jacket and what I would be wearing if it was made by a local tailor. As long as there's quality behind it, then we just need to support our own. We need to be proud of our culture and we need to build on top of whatever it is we have because this is where we have the most creative minds. This is where we have the most color. Um, we have such a wealth and in just our, our, our culture and our cultural diversity that comes along with that across all industries. So we first and foremost need to support our own and we need to be consistent in identifying the right product and supporting this right product and then building industries around these products and not being so quick to first of all exporting because charity begins at home mm -hmm. if we can be able to you know partner with uh, you know first of all regionally and then look at what we can be able to to exchange in terms of info and 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 products from say SA and as Kenyans we give you art and then we look at first of all Africa as a market and a, a huge market at that then I think we we've solved all our problems yeah um there are like several things running through my mind as well so I'm just like okay organize yourself I think that the first thing one of the first things that we need to think about is to start to see African things as things of value as well. Mm. I think maybe for a long time, I think that we are getting to that place because now you see like Kitenge fashion is like a thing, you know, people wear it and they feel proud or whatever. But there was a point where, you know, someone wearing that African material was like for a mama deep in the village. You know, it was it was attached to, you know, maybe poverty or something of that sort. But now it's sort of starting to become trendy. So I think that that's a good thing. We're on to something. So I think that it starts with us as Africans starting to see value in what we have. But then also on the other end of it, it's us as Africans in business, in the creative industry, being able to brand ourselves well and to put ourselves out there. Because the reason why I would pick a Gucci jacket over this other, you know, tailor by, in the corner shop is because I associate Gucci with something. And so if we you know, take it upon ourselves and understand the value of branding and the value of creating an image to, in the eyes of the customer that you're trying to reach, then it makes it better because then with time I'll start to see this tailor at the corner shop in the same way that I see Gucci because they've put something in my mind. So I think also us understanding the power and importance of branding and putting yourself out there because many times we want to save a buck on the branding and I think branding is where we need to be putting the money the most because that's what has the ability to form the minds, to change the mind, I guess, of the consumer, the person you're trying to reach. So understanding that. So just learning as Africans to see value in our things, but also to create the value and put value out there. So be the person that's always wearing these nice things and talking about, you know, the mama in that shop and talk about how it's such good quality. And the things really are good quality. If you look at the materials, if you look at all of that, it's just really good quality stuff. But because for whatever reason it is, we don't see much value in it. We would prefer to take the Gucci thing or we'd prefer to take, you know, this other big brand that we've seen. And yet they use like maybe the same machines, I think, or the, it's the same general concept is that you sit down, you design, and then you make the thing. So just learning to see value, us as Africans seeing value in the things that we are doing and the things that we create, but also seeing the value in putting ourselves out there because it begins with us. Someone is not going to come from Europe all the way to Africa to buy something if they have never perceived it in their mind that there is anything good in Africa. So we have to be the ones first and then, yeah. Karancha. <laughs> um, yeah, yes. no, 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 no. <laughs> 
it's, it's, it's such a beautiful subject to talk about and, and I love just how passionately it's spoken about by our generation and for me she's talked about ownership and for me it's ownership of the African story it's right we have brilliant writers we have writers who in the past would write stories of romance between this white girl and some white man and talk about snow and snowflakes which do not exist here but now our generation of writers is writing stories for the African about the African for themselves you know it's for us yes that we identify with and the world is beginning to listen and we're slowly being taken seriously and even as a continent regionally um, across the continent we're beginning to listen to each other we're beginning to understand each other because the auntie in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a Cameroonian's novel, in, in Bolombue's novel, is more relatable to, uh, to me, with me, to me, R- relatable to me, to yeah. me than the auntie in um, Harry Potter, Auntie Petunia. You know, Auntie Petunia cooks pancakes or whatever, while Auntie in, in Bolombue's book cooks, you know, gari. And, mm-hmm. and it's things that we, and so we're slowly beginning to consume other African Uh, products art if you're doing technology and so Kenya for example we are like milestones ahead in the way of um, technological innovation and I'm really really proud of it and we are now applying that innovation for Kenyans you know it's not we're not exporting innovation uh, or technological expertise we're doing it for solar for rural electrification we're doing it for um, for yeah mobile banking we're doing it for micro insurance We're doing it for insane things that you wouldn't even think about. Architecture, you know, we grew up with all these homes built like this. And why are we building homes like Europeans which need roofs like that? Because when it snows, the snow has to slide off. Now we know we can build with flat roofs. We're seeing people building Rondaville styles of homes, which are more South African and more traditional and make sense. And they tell a story and they make us question, why, do we, why did they build like that back in the day? And it helps us understand our culture more. Then the world is like, yo, why are those weirdos building round houses with flat tops? And then they learn. And it's, it's, I think it's, we just need to take ownership of the story, be loud, be intentional about our story, be unapologetic about our story. Hair, natural hair, you know? People, like the African woman now, wears her natural hair with so much pride. Mm-hmm. Well, before, um, it would be kind of strange. The natural hair girl was, look, was like, what is wrong with that one? You know, but now we're wearing natural hair and now people are doing retrospectives in museums in Europe and whatnot about African hair, about natural hair. And mm-hmm. we're learning about hairstyles of Ethiopia, which we didn't know existed. We're learning about in civilizations in Western Africa as East Africans. And it just helps with regional integration. I think it gives us pride. Nobody's going to talk. I was about to say the S-H-I-T <laughs> word. Nobody's going to talk. down at us because you know there's <laughs> you know there's there's a pride there yeah. and it's a regional pride yeah. it's no longer just oh those uh, weird south africans that wear beads we don't fully understand now we have an understanding the stories behind that yeah. we promote them we speak with pride we wouldn't let anyone speak down at an african brother and we stand for them because we just there's so much and then we find it ties us in as well and finally the world is listening you know the world is listening we have writers winning Um, Man Booker Prize Awards, which were very like British, you know, and very few black, uh, forget black Africans would win these literary awards and it's, and the world is listening. And I think it starts with us owning our stories, Chef Les cooking his Ugali chips, and then somebody's going to walk into that restaurant that has never even had of Ugali and now is having Ugali chips and they come from whatever part of the world and they talk about it and then there's curiosity. I, I think I've eaten Nugali chips once or twice, you know, I, I should have had it more. And, but this, it's, yes, we own the story, we tell the story, we tell it with pride in everything that we do, whether it's architecture, it's technology, writing, sales and marketing, the way we, you're talking about branding, there's branding, but there's also, you can create a very strong brand, but you also, we, we need to learn to craft our marketing communications for us. And that's another thing COVID has taught us, especially in our industry, hospitality service industry, that where there's no trouble. So now we're stuck with all these um, wonderful products and properties and facilities, 
and no one to sell them to. And we're like, oh, damn it. We've had a market this whole time right under our noses. And people have money. Mm. We were filling up resorts, coastal resorts in Kenya. People were filling them up with Nairobi people that come and fill entire 300 bedroom resorts. People who, and the marketing communication was never for, for them. Mm. All of a sudden now we have learned that marketing, we can modify our communications for us. And then anybody else from the outside looking in, you're, you're the outsider now, you know? And I think that's really magical. Yeah. All right, our final question. So we sit here as three brilliant minds. Um, we have a creator, we have a writer, we have a chef. Um, everybody's busy telling us who's looking into Africa at the moment, saying that entrepreneurs should start into trading, right? Why aren't we sharing ideas then amongst the different countries around us? Why is Karanja not phoning their marketing manager in an established hotel in South Africa and saying, give me a clientele, I'll give you a clientele. Uh, Molly over here, her being able to write books, why is she not finding out what the story is in another country and trying to see how they can have a conversations as authors? Why is Les not calling a well-known chef somewhere in Africa and saying, let's have a conversation. Let's start talking about a common ingredient that you have in your country that I have in my country. Let's make something. Let's educate people. What's taking us so long when we are seen as the most innovative continent? Uh, I, can I go first? <laughs> I think, <laughs> the things escape me. Yeah. Um, I think that part of it is maybe mindset, how we've sort of started off. We've for a long time been thinking in terms of how can I serve my family or how can I serve my immediate community or that kind of thing. Like many times within the African context for a long time when we start businesses, we've not been thinking of going beyond the border, let alone beyond your village, really. You know, it's just you want it to survive. You need to have money for, you know, your everyday needs. And that's really been the point and purpose of business and entrepreneurship here for a long time. Whereas, you know, abroad, when you look at so many of the big businesses, many of them are generational and it's been like that for a long time. So I think we are maybe slowly getting into that. But I think that that's maybe the reason we haven't crossed is just our mindset that for a long time we've just been thinking in terms of us. I just need to make sure my family is okay. I just need to make sure I have food for tomorrow. If I have food for tomorrow, I'm winning. And so we have to learn to now open our minds and think, okay, besides food for tomorrow, what about you know the next generation and the next generation and the next generation? And when we think like that, then I think we start to stretch beyond borders. So um, yeah, you raise a good point. I think, I, I don't know, I also maybe I'm not there yet because you said why, you know, even as a writer, why aren't I thinking about, and I'm like, I, I don't know, actually, I, I, maybe I should. <laughs> But I think that that's the reason is because for a long time, we've just been confining ourselves to our immediate communities, confining ourselves to just small thinking. And so I guess we need to open our minds and see each other as, you know, friends, potential partners, potential, you know, just people that you can do life with. But it also ties back to the experience of traveling. If I've lived in my village my whole life, I've not gone beyond there. I don't even know that there's South Africa for me to reach out to people and find out what they're doing and get in touch with them and see how to do something big. You know, I don't know that, you know, there's Kenya over here where people are doing this kind of thing. Like the content industry in Kenya is, it's magnificent. I just, I don't know, you know, we have to, I need to figure out how to tap into that, how to learn things from people there because they're doing incredibly well. But if I've lived in Kampala my whole life and I only know what's happening in Kampala and all that, I'm not going to reach out beyond these borders because I don't know. So I think it's just a mindset issue, opening our minds to think beyond borders, but traveling also, because that's what brings those experiences and what shows you what's going on in the different places, because then you meet different people and then you're like, oh my God, you're doing this, I'm doing this, how can we work together? But if I only know my family, then that's what I'm tied to. African creatives, African entrepreneurs have wanted regional integration more than their governments have for a very long time. I remember in the in the 90s there being um, African fashion fashion uh, initiatives to bring together African designers and this and that. But then 
people couldn't even get visas to get across from one country to another oh. you know you're trying to learn about textiles in this country from another but then there's no government records or databases i have friends personally who have taken it upon themselves to go into the rural villages of countries across this continent looking to discover traditional textiles how they were made there's because that doesn't exist in on public record it doesn't exist and it's expensive research is not a cheap is not a cheap affair mm. um the governments have not cared very much to support the the more um local industries the more creative industries mm. so you will find well maybe there might be an entire wealth of resource on on chemicals science. or whatever yeah. and for the sciences and stem there's not that much in the creative industry and yeah. so there's you have no records you have no you can't even get from one country to another without having to sit down and apply for a visa which might or might not be awarded or guaranteed um and then just that flow of communication is not really there um I find we are we are ready but then we face very many hurdles as far as in, like social and regional integration is concerned it's getting better it's mm. but I, I I do think with the help of public policy we could be a lot farther but I think mindset wise we we're, we're, we're doing at least in the last three decades we've been getting there you know with film film collaborations right. in on this continent and next to impossible next to impossible you film permits this license that license this that and that if you're a filmmaker in Kenya wanting to tell a story of somebody who was in love with a Kenyan and a South African for example and you want to shoot in South Africa or vice versa the hurdles that you have to go through just to get licensing and then on top of that funding is just it's it's a nightmare it's, i think we do have some some it's some of it is mindset some of it i find at public policy level that we have a long way to go and it would help us to achieve as young entrepreneurs and creatives what we want to achieve okay mm. wow that's uh, this this is another very sensitive topic to be honest but without mincing my words i would say we first and foremost need to go back to our roots as africans we are we come from communal societies where this village would be highly dependent on that village's resources and everyone would kind of have a system of trade where because we have an abundance of a certain resource then we will first of all trade with the next community to ensure our survival and our sustenance now unfortunately we were colonized and we adapted forms of government that were meant to take care of the survival of a different civilization so you look at our forms of go- government where I, i'm sure we were all colonized by the brits and these were societies that were very individualistic sorry to say because of whatever factors they may have experienced now we were forced to take on not just different forms of government but a different way of life and we were shown that our way of life is so primitive that we now have to learn or relearn everything that we know everything that our ancestors knew and so here we are trying to speak the most fluent english yet we have our local dialects here we are trying to adapt a different way of uh, uh, different forms of religion and different forms of trade and different forms of everything really and really forgetting everything forgetting that this is not how we survived so i think the solution to all this is to relearn go back to our roots and see how did we first sustain ourselves and the fact that how can we okay take whatever we have adapted now which is a a a, a very a capitalist society which sustains us and we have evolved into it but how do we adapt this without losing ourselves so looking at again how our ancestors traded and how they survived is that as a chef i have an abundance of a particular resource 
there's nothing that stops me from collaborating with a chef from the lakeside and adapting that culture or that way or style of food and then having someone tell that story or get all of us together from whatever region and we celebrate our own food, then everybody else can get in on it. So to be honest, there's nothing that stops us. Yes, there are hurdles, but we need to remove ourselves from that capitalist mindset where it, everything has to be about me. The more I am able to give, using an example that you said that we need to teach, the more you teach, the more you give, the more you're able to have the capacity to acquire more. So in my case, if I'm able to remove my, myself from being the only chef who feeds 500 people, I would rather focus on 50 very good people, people who are going to, I'm going to learn something from them, and then collaborate with someone else who is going to expand, stretch out that net. And, you know, we are stronger when we, when, when we are not divided and when you think about it, all the hurdles that you've mentioned come from the way we were conquered. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. I was taught to learn that if Karanja knows my trade, then he's going to steal from me. Yet that's right. not it. I'm going to learn much more from Karanja in as much as we are using the same resources. Mm -hmm. And looking at the abundance that is here, it's not possible for, for you, first of all, to conquer the entire continent without first of all focusing on your trade. And then you tell a story about that cook who comes from this region and makes food from that other side. And by the time you know it, we, that's, that's how we kind of combine forces. Mm -hmm. It's appreciating your own trade. It's going back to the roots. It's seeing, it's seeing that everything that we need is first of all in its abundance where we currently are. And then, yeah, we just need to remove ourselves from that capitalist mindset. It's great, but we, we need to go back to the roots. That's all I can say about that. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, um, we're just happy that you could, you know, just chat to us. I mean, you've really shown that entrepreneurial principles can be applied in any sphere of life, which is a great way, you know, to get people thinking and get people to converse. So thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you, really. I, I don't know what to say. I'm very excited to see how people actually receive this conversation. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, remember to follow us at Goldman Finance for more um, conversation around the entrepreneurial space. Remember, go for gold at Goldman Finance.